Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Clagg, Dean of the School, and I want to welcome you to the first uh, Dean's Lecture of the Year. And I think, as everybody knows, these are lectures where we celebrate the accomplishments of people who have been appointed or promoted to the rank of professor or school. And uh, I always start out by saying that um, even though I'm a cynical person, I think that, uh, that uh, I'm not cynical about this uh, accomplishment. It, it's difficult to be appointed to our faculty, but to reach the level of, uh, of a full professor uh, is really remarkable. And it's a decision that's made uh, not by me or by the AMP or the advisory board, that we all have input, but it's really determined by, by the, um, the opinions of your peers around the world. And you know, the process where we send out requests for, uh, for uh, letters, and, and it's that feedback from, from experts around the world that determine, in large part, the decision. So, so Ramin has, uh, Mojibai, has been here seven years. It's hard for me to believe that. I remember when, uh, when Bill first, uh, Bill Eaton, who was chair at that time, uh, came to me about, uh, about appointing Ramin. And um, one of the things I was struck with from uh, day one is that this person must have incredible tenacity to do everything he's done, and his commitment to academics was was unparalleled. So uh, you all know his background. That's another ironic thing about these is I introduce somebody that you all know better than I do. But um, but you know, you know he originally from uh, from uh, Iran. He trained in medicine and and uh, and psychiatry, uh, doing a residency at the University of Tehran, I believe, and then uh, and then subsequently came to the U.S. <clears throat> where he. He, um, he completed a residency in Iran, came to the U.S., to Oklahoma, and at the University of Tulsa got a master's degree and then a Ph.D. in clinical uh, psychology and then went on the faculty in psychiatry at Columbia. And during that time got an MPH and then decided that what he really uh, wanted to do was to, to be a clinical psychiatrist again and then uh, went and did a year as a schizophrenia, schizophrenia fellow uh, and then and then did a residency in psychiatry, and so has done two residencies in psychiatry and uh, and a master's degree and a PhD, all the time being productive in terms of research. So really, uh, we knew I knew without meeting him that he would be a person who would do well uh, here at Hopkins, and we're so happy he's here. Uh, he was appointed to professor last year, October 2014, and in addition to being a professor in the Department of Mental Health, he holds joint appointments in psychiatry and behavioral sciences in the School of Medicine, and is an active clinician who works in the Community Day Hospital uh, at Bayview. Do you, you work at the community program at Bayview or across the street, across the, excuse me, at Johns Hopkins Hospital? Um, he teaches an introductory course on mental health services and is director of the certificate program in mental health policy, economics, and services. And he's a, he's a terrific mentor to many students. And his work could not be more timely uh, than, uh, than now, um, especially in the setting of, of uh, the Affordable Care Act. He, he really focuses on barriers to care and trends in the use of behavioral health services in the U.S. And his lecture today is going to be partly based on the work that he's been doing looking at trends in use of antidepressants in the U.S. over the last three decades. He's published over 140 papers, eight book chapters, numerous invited presentations, serves on the editorial boards of a number of, faculty, a number of journals, and has written a, an incredible number of book reviews. Um, as I said, he came to us from New York uh, uh, seven years ago, but having lived around the U.S. in a number of settings. Uh, he's won numerous awards, I won't go through them all, but the Clerman Award uh, from the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression and the Lachlan Fellowship Award from the American College of Psychiatrists. So I'm looking forward to hearing Ramin's talk. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming uh, Ramin Mochibai to the podium. Ramin. So thank you very much for this kind introduction, uh, and uh, thank you for um, coming um, on this rainy afternoon to listen to my talk. So um, as Mike mentioned, my talk is about um, provision of antidepressants, but also generally mental health treatments in recent years. 
Um, most of you guys, I guess, have a background in mental health, but um, um, some of you may not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the impact and burden of mental disorders. But before that, I have a disclosure to make. When I present these data, sometimes people get the impression that I am critical of psychiatry or of mental health uh, treatments, um, that I have a negative uh, opinion about mental health treatments, and, um, but that's not true. I am a psychiatrist, I see patients, I prescribe medications, I do some psychotherapy, and I see its effect, um, especially in uh, severe mentally ill patients. So um, if I'm talking about um, deficiencies or um, what we are not finding in data, uh, it is with the aim of improving services. So that was a disclosure because uh, when I present this data, often people ask questions or bring up the uh, question. So mental disorders are common in all different um, settings, in low and middle and high income countries. They're not limited to one type of city. And they are among the most common contributors to disability globally. Um, they contribute uh, about 19% of years lived with disability based on a global burden of disease um, statistics that was recently published. When we talk about men common mental disorders, I'm referring to mood disorders like major depression, dysthymia, and anxiety disorders like panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety. Uh, mostly when we talk about common mental disorders, we, we have these disorders in mind. Also, mental disorders contribute to premature termination of education and unemployment, and that's some work that I've been doing um, with uh, Bill Eaton and uh, Elizabeth Stewart, who, has, who are here, um, looking at the uh, long-term impact of mental disorders. And there's growing evidence for the impact of mental disorders on physical health outcomes. And again, Bill Eaton has done some work in this area. Joe Gallo, who's not here, um, has done some work in this area, both in, uh, are in our department. So I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but uh, I've been told I should use the mouse and not the pointer. This is, again, data from the global burden of disease and shows the prevalence of um, disorders um, of course, the pointer does, ah, oh, yeah. Um, so um, this is data from 2010. The world population was about 7 billion at that time. Uh, and um, about 272 million people uh, were estimated to be suffering from anxiety disorder. Another um, 298 from major depressive disorder. And then there are other disorders that are less common, but when you add it up, it's a, a quite large a proportion of the population, uh, over uh, half a billion um, world by, worldwide uh, suffer from one kind of mental disorder. So as we have learned more about mental disorders, we have also learned that a large proportion of these uh, people do not receive any treatment, and that is uh, a major problem. We sometimes talk uh, of a treatment gap, and when we talk about treatment gap, we're referring to these people who do meet the criteria for a mental disorder but do not receive treatment. For example, in the epidemi epidemiologic catchment area study, which is the ECA um, study, um, one of the sites was Baltimore. This is a large national survey uh, of the uh, U.S. population, five sites. Um, only about 29% of those who met the criteria for a 12-month disorder had had any mental health contact in the past year. And other surveys have shown similar um, trends that, or pattern of service use. Large proportions of people who meet the diagnostic criteria do not receive treatment. And as a result of this knowledge, there has been uh, a concerted effort to improve access to services uh, for people who have these disorders, and also to reduce the stigma associated with treatment seeking. And the aim of all these, uh, all these uh, efforts is to reduce uh, this uh, treatment gap, to increase um, use of services, and um, eventually 
reduce the prevalence of disorders uh, and or um, the burden of uh, associated with these disorders. But the question is how successful we have been uh, in our efforts. So I should talk about a, a colleague who is not here, um, Anthony Jorm, who was visiting a couple of years ago, and he is an Australian. He was coming to teach in my class. And before the class, he came to my office, and he had read some of my work in this area and um, wanted to talk to me. And um, he said that I have these data showing um, there is increased treatment, but I'm not seeing any evidence of declining prevalence of disorders in Australia. What are you seeing and what is, um, what's your impression? So, and he had just published a paper uh, that had summarized the trends both in treatment um, of mental disorders and prevalence of disorders. So, for example, there has been a 178% increase in government funding of mental health care uh, in real terms between early 90s and uh, 2010 in Australia. 35% increase in mental health workforce per capita. Increase in use of psychiatric medication, and that has been the largest uh, change, uh, really. Um, it's a seven-fold increase in use of um, psychiatric medications, and that's mainly antidepressant medications. And also uh, an over 60% increase in psychologic psychological services and um, services that psychologists provide, mostly it is psychotherapy. But um, there have been three studies, one of them by uh, Jorman um, Rivley, that show that, uh, tre that a prevalence of disorders or prevalence of psychological distress has either not changed over this time period or may even have increased. So this is um, based on their data, um, shows uh, trends in use of antidepressants, as you see, um, uh, and it's uh, based on DDDS, uh, that's um, defined doses of antidepressants per 1,000 population per day. Uh, it went from 10 to 90 um, over this period of um, about 21 years. Whereas um, prevalence of major depression, that was assessed uh, using PHQ-9, which is a uh, um, it's really a screening measure, but it's commonly used in, in clinical settings, and it uh, replicates the, um, the uh, diagnostic criteria in uh, DSM-IV. Uh, the prevalence uh, of major depression assessed by that measure um, has increased. So he had published this paper uh, recently uh, when he was talking to me, and the uh, title is quite expressive. I don't have to talk more on it. His question was, why hasn't the mental health of Australians improved? And um, the conclusion that he got and the direction he was um, urging the Australian policymakers to move uh, in was to uh, enhance prevention uh, strategies. So another question he asked was, uh, so what do you know about the US um, regarding the trends in both treatment and also uh, um, trends in um, prevalence of disorders and distress. So I went and did some search, and um, one of the uh, earlier studies, that's a uh, um, really major study based on two population surveys, National Comorbidity Survey and National Comorbidity Survey Replication. One was done in early uh, 1990s, and the other one was done in um, early 2000s. So NCS was early 90s. NCSR early 2000s, and they, um, Kessler and colleagues looked at the prevalence of treatment seeking in different sectors, but also any treatment seeking. Um, so here at the any, I don't know if you can see it from back there, um, any are people who met diagnostic criteria for any of the uh, common mental disorders that are assessed um, in the uh, NCS. About 20% in early 90s had had any mental health contact. The prevalence went up to 32%, so a 50% increase. Now, uh, I have done studies and others have done studies uh, on these data and other um, 
data. And um, in this period, there was also a, a large increase in use of antidepressants, uh, almost a fourfold increase in use of antidepressants in this period. So more recently, um, remember NCS, NCSR was 90s and early 2000s. So um, as a um, result of this discussion I had with, uh, with uh, Tony Jorm, I went and looked at some other public access data and looked at the uh, prevalence of either uh, contacts with mental health professionals, uh, use of mental health treatments, uh, by which mostly we mean medication and specifically use of medications. As you can see, um, the uh, bottom axis is the uh, year, uh, survey year, and the, uh, um, the y-axis is the uh, percent. Uh, and there was an increase in almost all forms of treatment. Any contact with mental health professionals went from 6.3% to 7.9%. Uh, same thing happened with uh, any mental health medication use, it increased. Any mental health treatment also increased. So this, has, this is treatment, the story of treatment. So tr treatments have increased over this time period, beginning from early 90s to our day. Um, but what about prevalence of mental disorders? So there are two studies that have looked specifically at early 90s and early 2000s. The reason I focus in that period is that that's the period when we had the uh, uh, strongest or most rapid increase in use of mental health services. One study is by Kessler, and again, using National Comorbidity Survey and its replication, um, they looked at the prevalence of 12-month DSM um, psychiatric disorders, and the prevalence did not change. It was 29% in 1992, that's the NCS, and 2001-2003, it went up a little bit, maybe to 30%. Another study is by Wilson Compton and colleagues, and use that two different population surveys. These are all cross-sectional surveys. And um, both Kessler and Compton uh, studies were based on surveys that were very, very similar, both in terms of diagnostic criteria and sampling. Um, so the Compton study had somewhat different results. They found an increase, actually, from 3.5 percent in 1991 to 7.1 percent in 2001-2002. So these were uh, 90s to early 2000s. Then uh, again, I looked at from 2000s, early 2000s to uh, closer to our time. Um, I looked at the prevalence of um, distress, um, which is, was measured by um, a um, commonly used measure of psychological distress called K6. I'm going to show you the items on K6 so you get a sense of um, what type of construct it's measuring. I also looked at the uh, major depressive episodes measured using a structured interview. These data are, uh, all of them are coming from a survey, a population survey that is done annually in the United States. That's National Survey of Drug Use and Health or NSDU. As you can see, the uh, prevalence of moderate distress um, did not change meaningfully between um, early 2000s and uh, early um, 2010s, which means 2011, 2012. Um, severe distress also didn't uh, change. And uh, for major depressive episodes, it, they uh, started collecting this data in 2005, so I didn't have as many time points. but. Um, but again, there was no significant change over time. This is the K6 measure that was used to measure distress. It is comprised of six questions. Um, four of them ask about depressive symptoms, like during the past 30 days, about how often did you feel hopeless, uh, so depressed that nothing could cheer you up, that everything was an effort, felt worthless. And there are two questions also about nervousness and anxiety. And uh, the person gets a, a total score based on the uh, summation of these uh, items. So these were trends in distress and disorder, um, specifically major depressive uh, disorder. Um, so what about other outcomes? Uh, so we can't focus only on diagnosis as an outcome. Um, we should look at other mental health outcomes as well. 
So a um, while ago, um, actually in 2012, I looked at the data from National Health Interview Survey that assesses uh, disability. And they ask specifically what is the person attributing the disability they're experiencing to. So for example, the person says that I cannot walk, and the reason is that I have arthritis. So then that person is disabled and it's attributable to uh, arthritis. One of the questions uh, allows the person to say that the disability is attributable to um, mental health reasons. So um, to look at the uh, trends in uh, mental health disability, I divided the uh, sample into those who did have any physical uh, disability as well as those who didn't have any physical disability. As you can see, the data goes from uh, 1997 to 2009, and um, no change over time. Uh, it's flat. There's, um, if anything, a little bit the, among people who had a chronic uh, condition, uh, there was a uh, increase, slight increase in mental health disability as well. So no decline. So these were data from um, US. I also looked at data from UK um, because they have this nice survey that they use uh, every seven years called National Psychiatric Morbidity Survey of Great Britain. And um, 1993, 2000, and 2007, they have repeated this survey. Very similar, it's almost identical survey that's used every seven years. And they assessed mixed anxiety and depression. This is based on ICD, which is a different classification somewhat from DSM, but similar. Um, and also depressive episodes. They also uh, asked about current antidepressant treatment. Again, you see between 1993 and 2000, use of antidepressants almost four or five times increased. Um, but again, no decline in either mixed anxiety or depression uh, or depressive episodes. How about suicide? We talked about uh, that's a major uh, outcome, um, really, and um, no discussion of trends in uh, mental illness uh, is complete without talking about that. So uh, what do we know about trends in uh, suicide in the United States? Um, there was a decline uh, between early 90s and 2009 in suicide rates among the uh, uh, older population, that's 65 plus. Uh, that's the uh, darker uh, curve on top. But um, middle-aged uh, population, that's the middle curve, um, no uh, significant or meaningful uh, change over time. If anything, there was an increase in suicide rate between 2000 and 2009. And in the youth also, um, uh, there might have been a, a decline between early 90s and early 2000s, but then after early 2000s, uh, the trend has been uh, flat. So this is a very interesting meta-analysis that uh, Baldessarini and a group of his colleagues con uh, conducted, they looked at data from WHO. They compared um, suicide rates from a number of countries uh, all across the globe um, between 2003 and 1990. Now, this is a period when um, new antidepressants, the SSR uh, SSRIs, were introduced into the market. There was a huge expansion in use of antidepressants during this period. So um, if antidepressants were supposed to have any impact on prevalence of or incidence of suicide, you would see a, a reduction. Um, and so you would see um, more dots on the, uh, um, it would be your left hand, left hand of that line. Uh, but you can see the line really passes through the, uh, the dots. Almost half of the dots are on the right hand side, which means that the suicide rate ratio in 2003 compared to 1990 increased in those countries. Um, whereas um, those countries that are uh, on the uh, left side uh, of the uh, line, uh, in those countries there was a decline. So no consistent pattern in suicide rates uh, after increase in use of uh, antidepressant medications. So 
all these data that I showed you, uh, one thing seems to be clear, that the prevalence of mental disorders and psychological distress did not decrease after increased use of treatments. And um, uh, this is a uh, bit disturbing. And uh, we have been talking to other colleagues in UK and in Canada, and they are finding the same results when they are looking at their national surveys, that the prevalence is not declining, or the prevalence of treatment is increasing. So the question is why? And the question is, um, I th in my mind, important for public mental health because a lot of effort, a lot of funding is going into, uh, into expanding mental health services. And we want to get uh, the largest impact on population health um, with, this, um, with this increased um, use of funds and resources. But sometimes when I present this data, people say, well, this is not maybe a good question because mental disorders have so many different causes. Treatments uh, are so variable. The effect of treatments is, are not um, necessarily uh, consistent across patient groups. So um, being a psychiatrist, and psychiatrists are envious of other medical fields, um, so uh, I started looking at other health outcomes. Over time, has other, have other health outcomes changed? Um, we know that um, people are using uh, more medications overall. Generally, they're using more uh, statins, they're using more antihypertensives, they're using more medication for treatment of asthma. Name it, any medication you name, uh, almost any. I shouldn't say any. Uh, they are using more medication in that uh, uh, class. So what about physical health conditions? So this is data um, uh, regarding hypertension and use of uh, antihypertensive medication. It's based on my own analysis of NHANES, and it's adjusted for age, race, gender, BMI. And as you can see, uh, use of anti uh, hypertensive medications increased from around 17 or 18 percent to over 20, uh, close to 26 percent. And um, the prevalence of hypertension, which I defined as a uh, systolic 140 uh, over diastolic 90, um, has declined. How about uh, statins? Well, statins have increased. Uh, the use of statins has increased dramatically over this same period. Uh, it went from uh, a little bit over 6% to 16%. And, um, and prevalence of hypercholesterolemia uh, went down from around 16% to uh, 10 or 11%. So, so for these health outcomes, and I can show you other health outcomes. Now, there are exceptions. There are some health outcomes we are not seeing population effects. But um, for these health outcomes, at least, increased use of medications has led to improved outcomes. So why not in mental health? So there are a number of possible explanations. And that was um, the conversation that I had with Anthony. What are the possible explanations for this uh, no effect? One is that treatments are not efficacious. Uh, this is an ongoing debate in popular media. Um, you might have seen some books that are, uh, are even arguing that, um, and uh, medications in general, both antipsychotic and antidepressant medications, are harmful, not uh, beneficial. So um, there is, there are some uh, people who have that uh, view. Other possibility is that people are more willing to disclose symptoms in more recent years, and that is a. Um, that is a, a very interesting and intriguing possibility. We know that stigma for, um, regarding disclosing mental illness has declined, at least based on some European data that we have. And uh, literacy, mental health literacy has increased. People are uh, better able to identify major depression from schizophrenia and, uh, um, and put labels and suggest treatments uh, that are more consistent with professional views of treatment of these disorders. One problem with mental disorders, one limitation uh, of studying mental disorders is that uh, we rely on self-report. We do not have um, objective measures of disorders. And that is a major limitation. Uh, of course, in physical health, in medicine also, for a lot of disorders, you have this problem. 
An example is low back pain. I was reading somewhere 80 to 90 percent of cases of low back pain, you don't find any objective evidence in the uh, imaging. So it's not unique to mental health, but we have this problem more than other um, fields of medicine. So we rely on people's reports, and if more people are reporting mental health problems, and um, so you would expect an increase in prevalence. Now, some of these people are getting better with use of treatments, some are not getting better, but um, the two trends may actually be washing out each other. Another um, possibility is that there has been an increase in incidence of mental disorders. Uh, especially in the U.S. in this period um, between 1990s and now, we have had major social, uh, political, economic upheavals. We had the recession of 2007-2008. We had the 9-11 and um, we had um, unemployment and we have now uh, all these uh, violence, the gun violence that we hear about on the media. So. Um, so maybe there has been an increase in the stressors and that has led to increased incidence. Again, if the incidence increases, um, the effect of treatments might actually be washed away. Another possibility is the, um, that the treatments were not really well targeted. Um, there has been an expansion in use of treatments, we know that, but um, if the majority of people who meet the diagnostic criteria are not getting the treatment, then you wouldn't expect their illnesses to respond to treatment. So targeting of treatments is different um, than um, just trends in increased use of treatments. And uh, yet another possibility is that the uh, treatments that we know of, usually we, our knowledge uh, about treatments comes from randomized controlled trials where treatments are administered in a standardized way uh, for a, a long enough period. But in usual care settings, the quality of delivered treatments uh, often falls short of those standards. So that could be another explanation why we are not seeing uh, as much impact from treatments uh, with regard to uh, prevalence of disorders. And there might be other explanations. I, I would love to hear um, uh, your thoughts on that. But let me go through some of these explanations and um, talk about the evidence that supports it or um, does not support it. So regarding the uh, efficacy questions, uh, this is a study uh, by Locht and colleagues. Uh, they looked at, it's a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. They went out and took all the uh, uh, studies that had um, meta-analysis of, of these different trials and looked at um, the effect sizes. So on the, uh, again, your left-hand side, the uh, um, empty circles, you see general medical drugs, the effect of those general medical drugs. On the right-hand side, you see the blue dots, those are psychiatric drugs. And um, this is showing the standardized mean difference, uh, which is for those of you who are familiar with um, meta-analysis that is Cohen's D. It's uh, mean of one group minus mean of the other group divided by the standard deviation. Usually it's a pooled standard deviation or standard deviation of the control. So what you see is that um, the effect sizes uh, for both groups, for both uh, medications used for uh, mental health and for physical health, they're around 0 0.4. So uh, it doesn't, it looks like uh, medications, at least, that are used in treatment of psychiatric disorders in these randomized control trials are as efficacious as medications used in, uh, for treatment of medical conditions, like hypertension, diabetes, pain, etc. Now, I said efficacious. Um, many of you know there is a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. A medication might be very effective or efficacious in a uh, randomized control trial, but when the medication is used in a, a usual care setting, it might not be as efficacious uh, or as effective. Uh, that's because a lot of other factors that tie in. Another thing when we talk about the uh, efficacy of these medications is that these are comparing people who receive a medication to people who receive placebo. 
in the community, when we talk about the benefits of treatment or the uh, effectiveness of treatment, we are comparing people who are getting the medication uh, with people who didn't get the medication or psychotherapy with people who didn't get the psychotherapy. So there is the specific effect of the treatment and there is the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is very strong, uh, sp especially with regard to depression and even anxiety disorders. So here, um, question of efficacy. I'm not going to talk more about the efficacy. Um, next uh, explanation, possible explanation you remember, is that uh, there has been a change in public attitude. People are reporting symptoms more often. Now, this is a very tricky uh, possibility. I really don't have any good uh, data to go on that. And um, it is very possible that this has happened. Um, but as I mentioned, because we don't have any objective measures of mental disorders, it is really hard to investigate this question. But um, I did another uh, study using NCS and NCSR, and in that uh, study, um, they had asked people's attitudes towards mental health treatment seeking, mental health treatment seeking. They asked, uh, how comfortable would you be to talk about your problems with a mental health professional? How willing would you be to go to see a mental health professional? How embarrassed would you see if uh, somebody found out that you went to a, uh, a professional. And as you can see, um, let me just show you the uh, generation uh, effect. These are people who were in the 15, 24 year old. Um, this is the uh, right side uh, curve. Um, those people who were the, uh, in the 15 to 24 year old in the NCS, which was done in 1990, 1992. And so this same generation 10 years later, they're in the 26 to 35 year old generation, right? So you can see that their attitude, the attitude of this generation um, became much more positive. Um, for almost all age groups, the attitude uh, did improve, except for the uh, 45 to 54 years uh, old group. I fall in that group. Our, our attitudes don't change that much. <laughs> but. Um, but that is a indirect evidence. It's not direct evidence. But uh, I think I couldn't find any other direct evidence that would um, talk to this issue of possibility of increased reporting of symptoms. So another possibility, you remember, I, I talked about is that um, there has been increased incidence of these disorders because of what has happened in this country over the past 20 or 30 years. So there has been a secular trend increasing the incidence, and, um, and there has been a uh, effect of treatment reducing the duration of the disorders. As a result, the prevalence has not changed. That's the argument, right? So there's no evidence that the incidence of mental disorders has increased, um, neither in the US nor in Canada. The Canadian colleagues looked at that. They didn't see that. Uh, I looked at the duration also in the, um, in, in the British data, uh, duration, if anything, duration of uh, depressive episodes has increased. Uh, it hasn't shortened. So again, that explanation um, does not explain the, um, the mismatch between treatment trends and the prevalence trends we see. How about poor targeting of treatments? Um, so we know that the uh, treatment has increased, but there is growing evidence that these treatments are not targeted at the people who most benefit from treatments. So there, is, uh, there are a number of uh, reviews that have come out in recent years um, that show that antidepressants for, uh, specifically are not as efficacious in treatment of milder cases of depression than more severe cases of depression. I would assume in other disorders you would have the same uh, problem. But also, if you are uh, giving a lot of treatments to people who do not meet the criteria, you can't expect the number of people who meet the criteria to come down. So this is uh, data from NCS early 90s and uh, uh, NCSR early 2000s. Um, these are now studied in 2000, was published in 2008. Um, I looked at the uh, proportion of people who were reporting using antidepressants and also among those who were reporting antidepressants at these two time points, what percentage met the criteria? 
uh, for a, either a mood or anxiety disorder. Mood disorders are like uh, major depression, dysthymia, um, and um, anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder. What you can see is that, the, first of all, the uh, um, no, proportion of people who were using antidepressants increased by four times. 2.2% of participants in the NCS were, uh, reported using antidepressants compared to 10% in uh, NCSR. So it's a, a more than a four time increase. But the interesting finding was that the proportion who met the criteria declined from 70%, that's the blue area in the uh, left uh, circle, to 54% in the uh, right side. So the prevalence of and, um, mental disorders among those people who are receiving uh, treatments uh, might actually have uh, gotten down. Um, that was a survey data. This is based on administrative data. Um, uh, the NAMS is National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. I know uh, Caleb is very familiar with, uh, with this data. Um, we looked at, um, uh, my colleague Mark Olson, I looked at the uh, number of visits in which an antidepressant was prescribed and the proportion of those visits in which the clinician also entered a psychiatric diagnosis into the year record. So the proportion of, of visits in which a psychiatric diagnosis was entered is the, blue line, is the blue area. You see that it doesn't change that much, but the red area are those people who were prescribed an antidepressant, but the uh, diagnosis was not entered into the record. So now, when, when I present this data, usually people say, well, there are multiple reasons people don't write a diagnosis in a, uh, in a record, including stigma, including the fact that the person started receiving treatment maybe last year. At that time, the person met the diagnostic criteria, but now the person might actually not meet the diagnostic criteria, and so that's another reason. I'm not debating that. Um, it's possible that the uh, uh, red area is inflated, but the trend is there, and the trend, I could not find an explanation. None of these explanations would, uh, would remove this uh, trend. Again, we are talking about the poor match. I've done a lot of work on that, and I was told you have to show a lot of your own work in these Dean's lectures. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm not in love with my own work, but I just want to... <laughs> especially when it's done and gone. <laughs> so this is again based on the uh, NESDU uh, from 2014 study. I looked at the uh, people who were told uh, that they have depression. So the question was, did a clinician tell you that you had depression last year? And um, they were also given a structured interview for major depressive episodes. So. So I, took, uh, I looked at those people uh, who were both told that they have depression and met the diagnostic criteria and were told that they have depression and did not meet the criteria. So those people who were told by a clinician and met the criteria are the blue bars and the uh, yellow or brown, I can't tell the color, uh, bars are those who were told by a clinician but did not meet the criteria. So as you can see, about half or more than half of any population that you go out and sample and you ask them, um, did the clinician ever tell you that you have depression? And they say yes. And uh, then you say, okay, like uh, answer these questions in a structured interview. But half of them would not meet the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive episode. And if you look at the last um, age group, the 65 plus, the difference is dramatic. Um, about less than 1% really um, met the criteria. Less than 1% were both told by a physician and met the criteria, uh, whereas 4% was, were told by a physician but did not meet the criteria. Uh, this same pattern happens when you ask uh, about, when you look at the proportion who meet the criteria and are prescribed an antidepressant medication. Now, these data on prescription of antidepressants come from another data source in Haines, but the years uh, are consistent. It's from 2005 to 2010, and the age groups also uh, match. Again, you see that uh, among the, uh, um, 
you see actually an interesting increasing trend in prescription of antidepressants with age, and that trend does not um, come down much after age 65, whereas the prevalence of depression, uh, depressive episodes go down. Um, so only about 2% met the criteria for uh, major depressive episodes, whereas about 14% of people uh, over age 65 and uh, over were uh, prescribed. We're taking an antidepressant. It's not even prescribed. We're taking an antidepressant. So this was targeting. I guess I belabored this point to, to death. Um, but the other uh, possibility that is, is that the quality of uh, delivered treatments is poor. Um, and it's, it's a problem. It has been a problem uh, over the years. It's gotten better, I, I should say, over the years, um, mainly because of introduction of SSRIs, because clinicians are, primary care clinicians are much more willing to prescribe them at a therapeutic dose, but still remains a problem. Uh, and I'm not blaming uh, uh, my primary care colleagues. The problems are inherent in the structure of primary care, some of them. Um, what is the uh, difficulty of diagnosing depression in primary care? Mainly because, um, uh, because of the low prevalence. When you have low prevalence, you have low positive predictive value. Um, people, uh, students in epidemiology know that. Um, another problem is the time constraint in primary care. That is a major issue. If you have like 10 or 15 minutes, you have to prioritize what questions, what issues, what health conditions are you going to ask about. Um, they have limited resources uh, in primary care besides time. Uh, like they don't have managers who can follow up with the patient or case managers who can follow up with the patients. Um, high rates of self-discontinuation. This is not really a, a fault of primary care providers or providers in general. People tend to stop taking their medication. That's a, a reality. All kinds of medication, antibiotics, antidepressants, painkillers even. And um, the other problem is the low follow-up care. And few chances for a stepped care approach. Stepped care means that you provide the treatment that is needed by this patient. If the patient is presenting with some minor depressive symptoms, sleep problems, problems at work, you may not jump at medication first time. You may actually have a, a follow-up interview with the patient uh, observe the patient later on. If the patient is has more serious uh, symptoms, you may actually uh, decide to use a uh, uh, counseling. A few sessions of counseling is very helpful. Uh, then if the patient has much more severe symptoms and is, or is suicidal, then you may consider uh, starting medication or even hospitalization or referral to mental health providers. So these are steps along the way uh, that decisions should be made uh, based on the need. This is data on continuity of care. I mentioned continuity of care is really poor uh, with regard to antidepressants or all um, psychiatric treatments, even psychotherapists. The modal number of visits to psychiatrists or mental health providers is about one uh, in a lot of uh, surveys. So only about 28% uh, of people who were started on medication, on an antidepressant medication, really continued it for 90 days. That's three months. Um, three months is even less than what is uh, recommended in uh, most practice guidelines for treatment of anxiety disorders or depression. So the um, so majority of people stop the uh, medication before, um, before they start perceiving the, uh, the uh, benefits of it. Another um, issue, as I mentioned to you, is the quality. The quality is reflected not only in these process measures like continuity of treatment, but also in patients' perceptions of the treatments that they receive. This is a uh, study, again, based on NESDU, National Survey of Drug Use and Health, that uh, my colleague, who is a graduate of our department, Janet Kuromato Crawford, recently published, and I was collaborating with her. and. Um, so the question was, they asked people who had received depression treatment how helpful the depression treatment was. And some of them said it was not at all helpful, and some said a little, some a lot, or extremely, as you can see. Uh, and those numbers represent the actual numbers of people who reported that. There were about 9,000 um, people with depression who had received treatment and responded to these questions. As you can see, uh, the, the green parts are those people who 
had seen a general medical provider and a psychiatric, um, or I shouldn't say psychiatric, I should say mental health provider, could be a psychologist, could be a social worker, could be a psychiatrist. Um, the red are those who had only seen a, um, a mental health professional, and the blue are those who had seen uh, only general medical providers. As you can see, among those who said that the treatment was not at all, at all helpful, uh, more than 60%, that's, the, uh, um, that's this bar, more than 60% had seen only a general medical provider. When you go to those who say that treatment was extremely helpful, um, close to 80% had seen a mental health professional, either in conjunction with a general medical provider or, by, uh, or just a, a mental health professional. So you can look at it both as a, um, a negative finding or as something that gives us a clue that um, if you want to improve care in um, general medical settings in primary care, we should look at collaborations with mental health providers. And there are very good models of collaborative care um, uh, uh, sort of for depression especially in, um, that are implemented in uh, parts of the country. Um, that could be implemented and may enhance the, uh, the effects of treatment. So I'm coming to the close. Um, so summary, mental health treatments have expanded over the past two, three years, uh, decades. I, I hope I've shown that uh, enough, uh, especially the use of antidepressant medications. But there is no evidence of declining prevalence of mental disorders or psychological distress. And the reasons really remain elusive, uh, but we have some clues, we have some possibilities uh, and some indirect evidence. So increased reporting of mental health problem, inadequate treatments in usual care settings and poor targeting may, I think those are the three that are most likely contributing to this uh, phenomenon of no, um, or a very little uh, impact of treatments on a prevalence of mental disorders. Um, in the future years, with the expansion of insurance and um, use of mental health uh, treatments more widely in primary care settings, um, I think that treatments will increase. Larger and larger proportion of the population will be using uh, mental health treatments. And, um, the role of primary care uh, is likely to increase either in the form of medical homes um, or um, other forms of uh, organizing um, care for, for patients. And it's, it has been said multiple times, the quality of mental health care in primary care needs improvements. And I, I think that collaborative care models provide a, a very promising um, model, uh, especially since they are uh, very amenable to a, uh, to a medical home setting. But a final word is that I think that we may come to it that to reduce the prevalence of mental disorders at community setting in a meaningful way, we may need to um, put more emphasis uh, on prevention. In Australia, they are coming to that conclusion. In UK, they are thinking about that also. Disorders, mental disorders start from early on in life and, um, and to really reduce their prevalence uh, significantly, uh, we may actually need to focus our efforts there. I should acknowledge some colleagues who directly or indirectly have contributed to this work, including Mark Olson, Anton Jorn, who are not here, Bill Eaton is here, and uh, Elizabeth Stewart is here, uh, and Rosa Crum, not here, but uh, in spirit here. Uh, so, um, with that, thank you. Thank you, Ramin. So, uh, if anybody has questions, I'm going to ask you to use these microphones. We don't have wireless mics here today, and this is being recorded, so your question will only be heard if you use the mic. So, let me ask you, so since you went to, uh, uh, chronic disease, you know, you showed the data from Menhaines on the high blood pressure and hypercholesterolemia. Usually the way they're defined is by reaching a threshold target, you know, of blood pressure or cholesterol or medication. 
use, right? Because once you use the medication, you reduce that target. And did you, did, is that the definition you used? No, actually I took the population. I was looking at, I didn't look at people who had gotten a diagnosis mm -hmm. because there was the, the data have been published actually on exactly that prevalence of treated depression or successfully treated, uh, I'm sorry, uh, successfully treated hypertension. Um, no, I wanted to look at the population effect of these treatments. So I took the whole population and um, disregarded all those um, medication. Yeah, medication or diagnosis. And then you, know, you showed those slides early on uh, about increasing use of the medication, right? So what, what happens if you look at anti, uh, you know, uh, non-steroidals or other classes of medications? Or is it just that the, that the use of medication in general is going up because of uh, direct-to-consumer advertising or something like that? Uh, use of medications is generally increasing. More and more people are using prescription medications. That data comes from uh, Minnesota. Um, they have a, a sort of registry data that shows that. And Haynes shows that. I'm looking at that. The use of... Um, Prescription medications is generally increasing. Use of polypharmacy is increasing. And some of the increase in use of medication is because of the uh, statins is are, are really uh, becoming a major uh, player in, and uh, NSAIDs, as you said, and especially aspirin as a preventive measure. But, but it may just be a secular trend that doesn't reflect the underlying psychopathology at all, right? It just, just an increasing willingness to prescribe any medication or, or to take any medicine. Yes, that is possible. That's very possible. But um, yeah, it is very possible. But um, this is a spending that we have. We are. This is an item on our spending for mental health care. And what are we getting for that? The same question can be asked for a lot of these medical medications. Medications used for medical conditions. Uh, are we getting benefit from them in terms of population health? Quite clear, there are changes in the economy. The rich are getting richer, and the bottom fractions are doing worse and worse. Um, do they correlate with differences in mental health? Is there more depression amongst the poorest? That's a very good good question. I think Bill Eaton could answer that question because I know that you published something with uh, Messias on that. Uh, that counties in the country or states that have more. Um, a disparity in income have higher prevalence in depression? That's, that's another factor. We know that inequality is increasing, and that could be another um, factor that's contributing to increased incidence. Good Bill, you want to say, yeah, come to the mic. Or it'll be, it'll be, it won't make plus uh, So you were talking about preventative measures and mm -hmm. stuff and finding uh, treatment earlier or uh, encounters earlier. Uh, I found that there's major differences between the types of insurance that kids or teenagers and stuff like that have uh, in regards to what type of treatment they get. So ones with medical assistance, often if they get a referral from, say, me or the provider that I'm working with, uh, often will get a, an initial counsel where they get uh, a medication and then they get seen you know, for a follow-up and then there's no real psychotherapy or anything like that beyond that. But if they have a different type of medication, maybe private, all of a sudden they have this much more uh, elaborate type of therapy. So I thought and maybe you could comment on that and other forms of prevention that might be a good place to look. Yeah, actually this is a very good question. Some colleagues I know are working like on foster children in foster care and the type of treatments that they get. A large proportion of them are like prescribed antipsychotic medication for behavioral problems. So. We have this issue of poor quality of care associated with, uh, again, socioeconomic status. Um, um, yeah, and that is a major factor, especially in countries where, where there is no uniform insurance scheme, uh, and not a single payer like our country.
so I was uh, reminded of about social structural changes by the question of inequality, which is a result of the what I like to call, sorry if I offend people, the Reagan error. And um, but um, the, the other thing is depression is related to social solidarity and social networks, and there is fantastically strong evidence that the structure of our country is declining in all kinds of ways. Like, for example, the rate of divorce is going up. Uh, the rate of people going to PTA meetings is going down. The rate of people having friends in for dinner is plummeting. Uh, the rate of union membership is going down. All these measures of social solidarity have been going down, down, down. Now, we don't know what the impact of the electronic technologies is, but it's not, in my opinion, it's not the same uh, seeing somebody as talking to them on an email. And so that might explain a rise in the incidence of depressive disorder, it strikes me. The, the, the social structure is basically convulsing in the wrong way. So you look at the incidence data uh, in the U.S. I guess you are among the very few people who have looked at incidence. Um, uh, is it changing over time, your reading of the data? Uh, we didn't look at it in the decades that are important. So we looked at it too early. Too early. It, it wasn't rising from 81 to 93, um, and we didn't have good data from after that. But yeah. from my opinion, uh, so anyway. That's a good, good point. Yeah. A really good um, justification of primary care doctors sort of having limitations in how they can prescribe leading to this problem. But I was wondering if your data on antidepressant prescription takes into account indication. There's been a large increase lately of, you know, trazodone for sleep or Prozac for premature ejaculation or any number of things. Mm -hmm. Is it indication specific when you present the antidepressant prescriptions? No, it's not. But there is, this question comes up a lot, and that's a, a very valid question. A colleague, Tammy Mark, who's also a graduate of our uh, program, she actually published some data uh, on indications uh, for which antidepressants were prescribed, and about 97% were mental health, about, uh, I'm sorry, 93%, and 7% for, for medical uh, reasons. Um, now that mental health, uh, of course, is a range of mental health conditions, it includes OCD and minor depression or depressive disorder, NOS, not otherwise specified. Um, actually, most primary care physicians prescribe antidepressants, use that diagnostic label if they give a diagnostic label uh, and not a major depression uh, diagnosis. But um, still, the majority of uh, antidepressants are prescribed for mental health reasons, large majority. So, so as a primary ex-primary care provider, right, I think I have to defend primary care providers. So, yeah, yeah. so if, if you look at any clinical practice guideline, like say a treatment of asthma, you compare specialists to to uh, to generalists, right? right? Generalists always fare worse, right? Uh, but uh, but but there just aren't enough specialists for anything to go around. So for any condition, usually generalists provide eighty to ninety percent of care. So so you, you know Dan Ford and who graduated from here and worked in primary care at IMH and came back and did a number of studies looking at at. Um, depression treatment in clinical practice settings, in, in, in primary care practices, mm -hmm. and then work with Lisa Cooper and they did intervention studies. They found that detection is terrible, right? Recognition is terrible. Uh, docs can't tell depression from anxiety and, and, and they use a shot, they don't use, they, they're not good at it, right? Uh, but, but the interventions, you know, um, um, they're effective, but they don't last and, and it seems, always seemed to me that using some kind of standardized uh, questionnaire like a you know PHQ or something like that would be a good way to handle that in primary care because it relieves the ability of the physician having to make the diagnosis right mm -hmm. once they have the diagnosis then it's easy to tell them what to do yeah actually this this slide I, I did a study of uh, National Ambulatory Medical Care Service those visits in which um, a uh, a screener was used for depression and those that were not used and the match between diagnosis and treatment is much better if they use the screener as a diagnostic um, aid as the point that you are raising. I want to also add this, this is important to, it's an important point. 
I talked about over prescription in effect of medication. The other problem is under prescription or under use of mental health treatment. Both problems happen. Is targeting is not only overuse, it's also underuse. About 50% only of people with major depression who go to a primary care doctor are diagnosed or detected. Um, so I just want to make sure that this point is also, um, but I agree with you completely that happens uh, all the time. And many, uh, in, in many situations, that's because of the structure uh, of the primary care, the time restraints and, um, and also resource, um, resources that are not available. I don't know if this is a good summary question, but as someone who has uh, grappled with all the major uh, surveys that capture things about mental health, I wonder if you could just say a word or two about what you think is really missing from what we're measuring in surveys. What's the thing out there that we're not capturing that would help us tell this story better? Well, that's actually a very good uh, point. I can talk about surveys, I can complain about surveys for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's really hard to know if trend is changing in the U.S. And that is, um, Bill and I have been talking about this. This is, uh, is, is a shame because we spend so much money uh, on these surveys. Um, and uh, it's really hard to measure trends. And one reason is that we change uh, these surveys every few years. So if you change the surveys, you use different instruments, different questions, you can't track the same phenomenon over time. So I think that would be very helpful if we have, a, first of all, a core set of measures for mental health that everybody agrees is, is valid and, um, um, or valid enough, and also consistency in, in assessments uh, of mental disorders. Those two would help at least uh, so that we know reliably that there is a trend. And then, um, and then what other questions? Um, I think attitudes towards Presenting one's symptoms and disclosing one's symptoms might be also another thing that I would love to have in one of these surveys. Thank you. So I, so I said I was the uh, primary care physician in the room, but I see two of them over there too. So they, they can gang up on you at the reception. <laughs> I know. Uh, so I want to thank you, Ramin, for so, a great lecture. Well, thank you very much.